Hello there, you're very welcome to episode 14 of the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's Jamie Moore here and coming up over the next hour or so we're going to be joined live in studio in just a second by a young man called Daniel McKenna who's on loan from Wolves with Bray Wanderers. He scored his first senior goal in the League of Ireland on Monday night. Ireland underage international as well. We'll chat to him very shortly. We'll also be joined by Graham Burke, Shamrock Rovers attacker who's in the Ireland squad for the first time. It's a 40-man squad for three friendly games. He's going to tell us about it. certain people who've been saying that his call-up is a token gesture. We'll also hear from St. Pat's winger Dean Clark on his goal on Tuesday night. St. Pat's have now won three matches in a row. They face Derry City on Friday. Both teams level on fourth place, in fourth place in the league, should I say. While our first division focus will speak to uh, Finn Harps manager Ollie Horgan. Harps won a couple of games recently. On the way up the table, currently fourth in the league. And Terry Butler, who's taken over from Aaron Callahan as the manager of... Uh, at Lone Town, bottom of the table, no wins, although they only lost 1 0 to uh, Drada the other day. So we're going to speak as well to Terry Butler. And we'll be joined later on in the shoot as well by 98FM's and off the balls, Darren Cleary, too. We'll start this week's podcast, though, with Graham Burke, called up to the Ireland senior squad for the first time by Martin O'Neill for those three uh, friendly games. We spoke to him on the That's What I Call Sport on 98FM on Sunday, but here's the second part of this interview. He's going to speak a little about comparisons to Wes Houlihan, what it means for the League of Ireland to have a player like Graham in the squad, being happy living back in Dublin. But he started by telling us what he expects from his Ireland debut, if and when it hopefully happens. Yeah, if I was to get a bit of game time, I think obviously there'd be nerves there. Of course it's going to be nerves there. But I think like there'd be more good nerves than... Bad nerves, you know. I think when you go into a game with nerves, it's it's a good thing. You know what I mean? Like you can't like sometimes you go in nervous and you come out of a game like after having a great game and you're just like, why why did I feel so nervous? Like, but football at the end of the day is a game and you just go out and on the day you don't know what's gonna happen, but you can just go out and the only thing that you can do is say I'm gonna work hard and um, try and let then your game speak for yourself, but. I go there with confidence and try to compose myself and try just do what I've been doing for Rovers and try to let me football do do the talking. Yeah, speaking of letting your football do the talking, Graham, we're speaking to Graham Burke here. It's Jamie Moore in the Croke Park Hotel. Graham's has been called up to the Ireland squad for the first time, meeting up hopefully next week to play games against Celtic and Scott Brown's testimonial, and then against France and the USA at the Stadium, which will be John O'Shea's last game. He's going to captain the team uh, in that one as well. Uh, Graham, we know that Wes Hoolan has just retired from international football recently enough, another former Belvedere player, another former inner city lad. There isn't too many players like your type in the Ireland squad, number 10s, you know, wide players, strikers who are comfortable with the ball and, and want to get on the ball. So there is definitely a gap in the squad for someone like you. Do you feel that is the case and do you feel if you do get the chance to perform and, and impress that you have, a, you have a chance to do well? That's what I like to think that the way I play football will be nearly the same as the way Wes plays the footballers and try to get on it, try to start things, try to get the ball moving. Try to be calm on the ball, try to create things and obviously like for me this year I'm trying to add more goals to my game. And I think like is in having Wes there to look at and to see like how how he performs, how he gets things started. I think like hopefully like not just for me but I think is in teams need a, a player probably that can do them kind of things. Yeah, is he someone when you were growing up you would have Looked up to, I know when you would have started at Belvedere as a six-year-old, he would have probably still just about been at the club or maybe he would have just left. He's had a fantastic career, obviously still hopeful to continue in club football, but is he someone you're quite similar from town, played for Belvo, you know, had some time in the League of Ireland, he's in the UK, you've been in the UK, you're now back here, so you're, apart from in style, your stories are similar enough as well. Yeah, though I used to watch uh, Wes, I used to go down to Talca and watch Wes and uh, like all friends and that used to go down like if a Friday night and watch him down there and then obviously the career he's had since he went to England has, has been unbelievable. I seen uh, the send off he got when he retired and obviously like the career he had with with Ireland and he was a fabulous player. Yeah, I heard a piece on one of the radio stations during the week and the presenters were suggesting that your call up was a token gesture by Martin O'Neill. The presenter asked the contributor, is Graham good enough to be in the Ireland squad? The answer was no which I think is a very, very silly uh, comment to make. But anyway, it was made. What do you make when you hear things like that? And we've seen over the years, you know, Sean Maguire and Daryl Horgan both currently in the squad. Sean, fantastic, doing well in the UK, as is Daryl. Loads of other players the same. In my opinion, you're in the squad because you're good enough to be in the squad and you've done it here and Martin O'Neill has seen that. But not everybody would agree with that, which must be a little bit frustrating, or do you care? I don't, I don't really care. As a football player, everybody's going to have an opinion. on You, you know what I mean? Uh, everybody like you know it's nothing you can do the only thing you can do is is focus 
on football and believe in yourself that's the main thing like you know so if somebody doesn't think that I'm good enough to be in the squad that's that's their opinion at the end of the day it's it's down to Martin and what what he thinks that's all I the opinion that I will take out of it that I care about is what he thinks but other than other people's opinions I don't really pay attention to that yeah, I know there's three important games for Ireland coming up. Uh, the first game is on uh, Sunday of next week. Just say next week uh, against Celtic in Celtic Park. Scott Brown's testimonial. Then I made a 28th It's a game against France, followed by uh, June the 2nd, a game against USA. Graham, it comes in a busy time for Shamrock Rovers. The day before the Ireland Celtic game, Sligo, you guys are in Sligo. You then are due to play St. Pat's on the Tuesday. Bowls in the Dublin Derby on the Friday. Two great games sent on Dock on the 1st of June, all in a period when the Ireland games are on. I know Stephen Bradley said he plans to speak to Martin O'Neill about that. Do you know yet when you're going to be in the Ireland squad and how long you'll be with them for? And how do you hope that's worked out? Because I know you're loyal to Shamrock Rovers, but at the same time, the chance to spend two weeks with Ireland is something that you probably don't want to turn down. Yeah, of course. I think, um, obviously, the Gaffa and uh, Martin are going to uh, speak on that and I'll find out um, what's going to happen regarding the situation. But obviously, it's a busy schedule for us and the games that you just had to mention are important for us because... We need to start there uh, winning games. I think like the last couple of games we've only picked up the result against Cork and obviously a tough game against Waterford last night where we picked up a point but we need to be uh, putting more points on the board. Like when we look at the table like is in like nearly a month and a half ago we were challenging to go top and now we've just fizzled down the league so we need to start climbing up that league again. Yeah, if we if we can stick on the team of Rovers in the League of Ireland for now, can you put your finger on what the slump in form has been down to? I think it's one win in, in nine games at this stage. The Cork win was an unbelievable win at three nil. You know, played really well. Your goal, of course, happened in that game, but results in the last while haven't been good. You have slipped down the table, and even now the battle for Europe looks on. Apart from the battle for the title for you guys, and I know there's still over half the season to go, but can you put your finger on, on why things in the last nine ten games haven't been what they were before? Just been like, I think it's a bit inconsistent. You know, we've gone out and put in great performances and, and got wins and then the next week we go out and we don't put in the performance that we did the week before. And I think like, obviously, nobody has really been cutting us open as in to score goals against us. I think we're giving away some like cheap, cheap goals and that if we can just um, stop that, you know what I mean? I think that will help us and is in to try and maybe score more goals and like when we get that one nil lead sometimes we slip and we end up losing the game is in order to be ruthless and uh, go on and um, end up getting two or three I think that will help us but I think just consistency is in performing week out and week week out and week in as in and trying to not concede them um, stupid goals yeah Graeme last two questions just on your inclusion in the Ireland squad overall and uh, you know everybody's going mad that it's a League of Ireland player in and it's 1-40 in 40 and, and so on and we've had previous players before you've come back from the UK and, and you've been you know playing really well here in the league just speak to me a little bit about kind of the League of Ireland for you you've clearly played very well but you, you've had to come into a, a really good club in Rovers and be able to do it and be able now to go back on the Ireland squad and I know your ultimate ambition maybe is to go back to England eventually but just on the league here that Martin has picked a player not on a token in my opinion on that you have done well enough in games in the League of Ireland to merit being in a squad albeit it's friendly games and the UEFA Nations League it's not we're not near a qualification campaign but he still picked you for the squad from the League of Ireland Yeah I think like it's not just for myself but for every player in the league if you just look and go and perform and go and do the best that you can obviously like if you look at the Dundalk boys and Shawnee is in going to England it's a great like platform if you want to go and prove yourself in the league and go on to put in great performances and you know what I mean that there's people there watching and you can get to places where you want want to be and I think like for myself coming back to Shamrock Rovers I've, I've loved every minute of it the gaffer has given me um, an opportunity to go and uh, express myself and to go and show what he can do and obviously like with this call up on the back of it you know what I mean I put that down to the gaffer having the belief in me and everything to give me that chance and just to show what I can actually do 
And for you, I know it wasn't hard to take that chance, but you did come home from England a little disappointed that it hadn't worked out for, you know, reasons. I'm sure you probably could have stayed in England had you wanted, but you decided to come back to come back to Dublin to your girlfriend and your family and, and to sign for Rovers. How have you managed to bring your performances to the level where you got into the Ireland squad when you've, when you've come from a, a level where, again, for reason A, B or C, it didn't work as well as you maybe would have liked? I think it's just being being happy, you know, coming home and <clears throat> being with the family, having the girlfriend, having friends, having everybody around you that you can just go and live normal life with the people that you love and everything like that is in. It just makes you feel like from the first day, the first moment I, I came home, I just felt that. And you know what I mean? Going into Rovers and I think it's in me being happy and everything, it just shows in your football and then obviously being up at Rovers and what's going on and see the direction of where the club wants to wants to go. I wanted to be a part of that and I wanted to uh, go out and express myself and show what I can actually do. And uh, I think like obviously the gaffer having the belief in me and telling me that he's going to play me in a position where he thinks I'm best to where instead of putting me on a wing or anything like that that has helped me as in I'm playing in the actual position that I'd like to play in. I think that has shown in, in performances. The importance of being happy and having family near you off the pitch can't be underestimated. People who've either been in England or still in England or have come home have always said it. Mm. I don't want to talk too much about you know life in England because you're not there now currently, but life back in Dublin for you, just being around family and being able to finish training, jump in the car for 20 minutes from Rollstone, be back in town, back at home, back around your your nannies and your granddads and you know your parents and you know your missus and all is a really nice thing that you didn't have for the previous probably what five years, six years more. Yeah, well, it was me, me and the girlfriend away living, and um, obviously I had family every every month coming over, you know. But obviously, when you come home from training and you're going home, this is two years you're trying to do things. You know what I mean? It's quite. It's quite boring at times, you know, so it's an order to come home and have the freedom to do whatever, as in just to even go down to your mates and have a cup of tea, play the PlayStation, have a chit-chat, you know what I mean, as in to do anything, like, I think that that helps you, you know what I mean, it's just feel more happy that you can just do these things where it's kind of limited, limitless in uh, England to do. Graham Burke, are you as good at football on the PlayStation as you are in real life? No. No, no. Yeah, fantastic stuff speaking to Shamrock Rovers, Graham Burke, a man who we hope will be playing for the Ireland senior team in those friendly games. Uh, this coming Sunday, of course, which is Scott Brown's testimonial in Celtic Park against Celtic, and then the games against France uh, in France and the USA back in Dublin as well to end uh, the international season for the boys in green. And thanks as well to the Croke Park Hotel who lent us their executive suite for the interview which we did over the weekend. The full podcast, you'll find it on offtheball.com. You're on the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast, episode 14. It's Jamie Moore here. And we're delighted to welcome into studio a young man called Daniel McKenna, Daniel plays for Wolves. He's on loan back uh, in the League of Ireland with Bray Wanderers. And he scored his first senior goal on Monday night in a 2-2 draw against Waterford. Dan, thanks for coming in. How are you? Thanks for having me in, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm great. Cheers. Thanks a million. First of all, um, talk us through your first League of Ireland senior goal and the story behind it because it's uh, quite interesting. Yeah, it was a weird one. Um, five minutes before kick-off, uh, Reese Gorman got injured in the warm-up and Graham had caught me over. I didn't know how serious Reese's injury was, but um, he was holding his hamstring and he had to be carried off. So... I thought, you know, I'm going to have to start now, so I had to just start down preparing, you know, five minutes before the game. Um, the boys, you know, it was a little bit quiet, a little bit flat in the warm-up, and I did, didn't know how the game would went, uh, was going to go, sorry. And, um, you know, it just kicked off, and three minutes in, um, you know, we were attacking down the right-hand side, Gary takes the ball down out of the air, and I, I heard a shout from behind, Paul O'Connor shouting at me, he's like, you know, I'll sit, I'll sit, you go. So I'm just scanning, you know, to get into the box. Um, I get in, and luckily enough, Dylan Hayes put a great ball, you know, right onto me head, and um, I just headed it home. You know, I was I was delighted. With it. I was really happy place. Yeah, fantastic header as well, and you know, really cool story that you weren't in the team, and you've been playing lots this season at right back. You played in midfield because Reese had got injured. The cross comes in, and even though you're not the tallest, you managed to get your head on and yeah. bury it into the far corner. Yeah, I was delighted. Um, before the game, we were going through the set pieces with Martin, and. Um, Obviously, I was doing Reese's role, so he was saying, oh, Reese is in, in the box attacking, and he was saying, you know, will, will I, won't I? And I said, no, I actually fancy it today. So, 
Um, even though I wasn't a set piece, I was happy to get in and score ahead. I like score a goal anyway. Yeah, and interested as well in uh, once you've scored your celebration, you blessed yourself, and then you were uh, you look quite happy. Yeah, um, obviously delighted to score a goal, surprised as well. But I don't very often score, but when I do, you know, the little gesture is for you know a teammate that passed away when you know we were playing together on the pitch. Yeah, I know as well. Every time you play a football match, you've said before that you want to go on the pitch and remember your teammate. His name was Shea. Yeah. Shea A. Tigbo. He died in uh, 2015 while you were playing for Belvedere as well. And It's something that yourself and some of your former teammates at Belvedere do a lot is you try and, uh, when you're playing, remember him and uh, the friend he was to you. Absolutely, yeah. Um, obviously, to be taken so early and to be taken doing something that you love, you know. Um, and we have that opportunity to go on now and, and play the game that he loves. So to... Just a little a little memory of him and stuff like that. Um, just a little gesture for him, I suppose. Yeah, how nice is that as well? And it's uh, nice as well to get a point against Waterford. Finish 2-2 at the end. Last-minute penalty by Gary McCabe, who I think missed a penalty the previous week as well. Waterford had gone 2-1 up. Paul Keegan and Courtney Duffus with the goals. But to pick up a point at home against a team chasing Europe, um, I suppose you're probably happy with the point. Absolutely, yeah. I think it was fully deserved. The point was um, we were a stronger team in the first half, I felt, and and they sort of came out in the second half and they probably got a bit off the manager and um, they came out stronger in the second half. wasn't a lot of football played. They have two big lads up top, so they used them to their advantage. Like And um, I think, I don't know, 70th minute or so, they must have got their second goal. But we, we kept fighting, you know, we, we changed formation a bit. We went um, a bit more attacking and the goal was, goal was fully deserved, in my opinion. You know, I think... Um, Gary missed the penal. He, he scored his last penal, but missed his one before that um, against Limerick, I think. Um, so to have the courage to go and you know take the next two and score the next two really well, he scored one against Bowes as well. So um, 98 minute, you know, and to you know most people would just put that ball down the middle, but he buried it into the corner. So it was a great penal and a fully deserved point. And you can see, sorry, you can see, you know, people coming up to up to Bray. It's not easy anymore. You know, it's not like it was before. Um, taking points off Rovers, good performance against Dundalk and stuff, making them work for the three points and taking another point off Waterford, who are all top five teams. Like. Yeah, interesting in that as well because the home form has been quite good since Martin Russell's come in in an advisory capacity and Graham uh, Kelly as uh, the manager, uh, of course, after Dave Mackey left the club. You beat Shamrock Rovers, you beat Derry, of, of course, as well. Uh, but defeats then against Sligo, Limerick and Bowes, who were three of the teams around you in the relegation battle, certainly in the case of, of Sligo and Limerick, that's definitely true. Uh, what do you put that mixed form down to that you can beat some of the top teams and then you've lost, you, you probably would really have needed points against Sligo and Limerick in games that you'd probably describe as almost six-pointers? Um, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say if it's... Um getting up for games. I don't think we've got a problem with getting up for games. I, in a way, I think it's how others, how, how them stronger teams are looking at us and treating us or whatever. Um, you know, you could see when Derry came down, they they didn't show as much respect as what it was when we were up there in their place and they, they beat us 5-1 and, and, you know, they must have thought, you know, here, this, this is it. Um, all we have to do is show up today, but that wasn't the case. So, it's just, we, we need to treat every game the same and, Teams uh, who are playing against need to treat us as if they're playing, you know, a top four, top five team as well, because we will take points off them. Um, but we, we, you know, the squad depth isn't, it's not massive at the moment, and you know, playing Friday, Monday for most lads is, it, you know, from from an early stage, other teams would have uh, great squad depth, and we just don't have have that at the moment. So. Lads playing, you know, week in, week out, and it's it's probably getting a bit tiring then on the seventieth minute, you know, for people. Um, but you just have to dig in, and I uh, suppose, and try five for points. Yeah, I think that's an interesting part of you, and maybe the reason why you moved to Bray on loan from Wolves. You signed for Wolves from Belvedere Dan in twenty fifteen, the summer of of two thousand and fifteen. A very high profile young player in the country at the time. You've been in, in the UK now for a couple of years. Just give us the background as to why you came home and why you've chosen Bray because you've played lots of games in a men's league, in a senior team, which was the aim of the game. Yeah, um, I spent a couple of years over there. Um, last year, I was I was doing pretty well. I was up with the under-23s um, as a first-year scholar, so I was doing well. And um, towards the end of the season and, and this season, they recruited really well. Um, they got some strong lads in. And um, it was harder for me to, then to, to get into the 23s team, so... I was playing under 18s every week, and it wasn't it wasn't challenging um, physically or you know football and wise. So if I couldn't get into the 23s team, I, I brought it up that 
it would be good for me to get out and experience men's football like and I felt the the League of Ireland was probably um a better step than the non league over in England. That that was just my opinion at the time and I've come back and it is a tough league and I I felt, you know, coming straight in playing Friday, Monday, Friday, Monday against you know great players and stuff, and it's a ten-team league this year, which has made it even even more harder. And um, so there's no easy points any week. And Bray, Bray was a team who I felt I could get a lot more minutes at, which was I didn't want to just come back and and not play and try and week in week out, but to come back and you know be playing as as many games as I have is is what was my aim. So. Yeah, and of course as well, you know, you've been playing, as we said, in men's football. Apart from the physicality of it, what would you say are the main differences and the main things that you've found from playing in competitive men's football where results matter in comparison to in the UK, whether that be under-18s or under-23s where it's not competitive and, and, you know, the majority of people who've played in have said that it's, you know, there's nothing on the games as such, which means, you know, when you come here and you're playing for wages and you're playing in front of crowds and under pressure because it's a relegation battle, it's a totally different test. I've actually loved playing away games and um, love getting a bit off the fans. Like that's the bit I, I, I enjoy about it. Um, but the physicality, as you mentioned, that's that's a big difference. That's a big factor to it, and the tempo as well. So, um, and especially coming back and, and playing as a as a fullback, you know, coming over as a midfielder and playing as a fullback and trying to get uh, used to that position. And you know you're up against some good wingers in this league, um, off off all of the teams, and uh, to try and adapt to that, that has been a challenge for me. Um, but playing in front of the crowds, I, I feel, will help any young lad. You know what I mean? If 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 he does go on and have a, a big career, yeah, you're gonna get that. So um, playing in front of the the crowds and the physicality of the game and and the tempo and just fighting for three points, you know. We need to fight for three points, and and if you're in England, not that you don't need to fight for them. Um, it's not going to rely on on lads losing a wage because they if they have a three year contract or something, they'll be there next year. But it's not like that over here. You need to fight for your place and fight for your wages and and pick up points in the league. Yes, and speaking of uh, playing from the big crowds, Dan McKenna, uh, this Friday, 7.45, Turner's Cross Cork City against Bray, you'll really enjoy playing in front of a big crowd there, probably five or 6,000 at the match. Having come from England where you're playing in academy games in front of smaller crowds, and not always in stadiums or in empty stadiums, how have you found the adaptation to playing, particularly, as you said, in front of the away crowds where it's louder, there's more of an atmosphere? I'm sure it's a great place to play, but how, how did you actually find that originally? Because it is a, a totally different experience. Bray, I found it really good. Um, First game I played against Dundalk, um, I think there was about 20 minutes to go and and I just sat there, well not sat there for a second, you know, I just stood around and, and I just took it all in, the crowd, um, great atmosphere up there, it was first game of the season and it was uh, one all at the time so we're fighting for 20 minutes for, for a point to keep that point, a valuable point and just I just took it in, you know, the crowd there and uh, cheering on their team and giving us a bit of abuse, so that 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 was good. I really enjoyed it, and and I have ever since. You know, even up in Bray, um, you know the the away fans, the Dublin teams, and and whatever uh, bring a lot of fans with them. So you still get a bit up in up in the showgrounds as well. Yeah, of course as well. And, and if we do speak a little bit about Bray as well, the crowds in Bray haven't been fantastic this season, but the people who have attended the matches have certainly um, made their presence felt. And in recent weeks, since results started to turn as well, it's been a much better place for the players to play football. You're on episode 14 of the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's Jamie Moore here in studio with Daniel McKenna, who uh, plays for Wolves in the UK, formerly in the Championship, of course, just gone up to the Premier League as champions on loan back here in the League of Ireland with Bray Wanderers from Dublin, Ireland International under 15, under 16, under 17, under 18, and under 19 as well, which is quite an achievement which we'll mention in a couple of minutes time I want to focus down a little bit about your time in the UK and you'll hopefully be going back there but Wolves you've got some time left on your contract for those who you know wouldn't know too much about the UK and about England and you know everyone sees the dream of wanting to go there talk to me a little bit about life as a, an academy player at one of the top clubs in England um, I suppose you're in it's like a normal day's walk as an academy player you're in um, as a 16 year old 17 year old You'd be in at half eight and you'd get home at maybe half four, five o'clock. So, you know, if that's a normal day's walk. Um, but it's when you come home, you're, you're in there, it's like this little bubble when you're at the club and everyone, you know, it's like um, a big family or whatever you want to call it. And you get, because you're with the same 18 lads every day, I suppose. You're in the dressing room with them, you train with them, you eat together. 
you, you do gym together, you do everything together, so you just get, you know, you form really good relationships and stuff, but, you know, when you go home, you might only be living with one or two of them lads, and um, you, you might not even get on with the, the lad that you live with, but thankfully, I live with two lads who I got on, on great with, uh, and I had a great Dave's person as well, who I, I love spending time there as well, so, but you just go home, I suppose, you, you chill out, um, I, I wouldn't go out much at all um, from, from where I was living. I would just chill out in the house, you know, maybe go into my bedroom, Netflix, PlayStation, I suppose, and, you know, you'd get up the next morning and do the same thing. Yeah, and from the point of view of the football, if we focus on that first, how much do you feel you improved as a footballer in the two and a half, three years that you were there? I know you're going to go back as well, but from playing schoolboy football here, international football, to going and being a full-time footballer, how much do you feel you improved and what things do you feel you improved on? Because the idea is when you're training more often, obviously you get better. Yeah, um, I couldn't tell you how much I have exactly improved, but I know that I have, even me understanding of the game, um, technically, I've I've improved, um, but I felt me last year, even though I wasn't playing twenty threes, um, the coach that I had, Sean O'Driscoll, was really good with us, really good with the with the lads, and um, he had come from a few senior jobs. He was at Walsall, Brentford, and a couple of others, and um, for him to come in with the under eighteens and and really learn us more about the men's game than you know than we had known before was was extremely good and. Um, I always took his advice on board, and and this is something he had told me he had told me to do. He he would look into this, see me get out and and challenge myself against men. So, um, yeah, it was good good learning experience um, under him. And technically, you know, lads will improve your training every day. You're playing on a on a Saturday or a or a Monday night or whatever. Um, so you, you are going to improve technically, but just your understanding of the game as well, I suppose. Um, being around coaches. Who, who are full-time and stuff like that, they, they can only bring it on. And then if we move from on the pitch to off the pitch, I know from speaking to you beforehand, the digs where you lived was a really nice house, really nice people, good food, nice bedroom, that sort of stuff as well. Uh, you come from Dublin, from the inner city. I know your mum, Karen, and your, your brother and your sister and your granddad live with you. Um, it's very different going from here to going to there, and you've now come back for the last couple of months. Just talk to me about the comparisons of being you know, a lad from the inner city in Dublin living, you know, with your family in a small place to, first of all, moving country and then moving into a new house. I know there's a great photo of yourself and your mum when you were leaving the airport for the, the first time to move away as a, as a 16-year-old back in the summer of 2015. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a little bit of a culture shock, you know, um, moving away from the inner city. It's always busy. My, I only live in the flats over at Greek Street and um, it's a two-bedroom, but, you know, you, you have you'd have so many people just coming in and out of your house and stuff like that and it's it's busy you know 24 7 and then to go over to uh my digs over in england a uh, lovely place you know there was i think it's a four bedroom five bedroom um for just four of us there anyway five of us including um the digs lady and her her husband um but now it was it was it's a lovely house over there it's like um you ever see the lane down the aol it's like having a house down that lane in the middle of nowhere, you know, on its own. So it was different coming from the flats to, to go into a place like that. But, you know, it was lovely and I, I would say it was the best days over there. So we are blessed to get it. Yeah, and as well, I mentioned the photo of you and your mum leaving the airport and we were speaking on uh, Off The Ball AM yesterday about the Irish under-17s in the Euros and, you know, we were talking about, you know, the lads were asking about some of those players and what kind of careers they might have. <laughs> What's the the kind of process like when you actually finally do move as a 16-year-old? It's been the dream of everybody, but when you actually go and you move, it probably hits you, you know, quite quickly that, wow, I've actually mm. moved country as a young person, moved home and moved to a new job. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure lads who are, who are getting these moves at that age, I'm sure they've been back and forth like I was. You know, I was, I was back and forth to Wolves when I was um, 15, I think, but... Um, just short weekend trips and stuff like that and I was staying at the digs where I was going to be staying because uh, I had made my decision I think at that age and stuff like that but I didn't officially sign anything until a couple of months later um, but I'm sure some lads will have done that so they'll know what they're in for but it's it's the first eight weeks I suppose when you move over um, it's tough you know Week seven, week week six, week seven, week eight you know you're, you're realising like, I, can't, I can't actually go home you know I have to I have to be in the weekend or I have to have a game. I have to come back into work, I suppose, on Monday morning, so I can't go home. But 
uh, like the clubs will they they recognise um, Wolves were really good. If I ever was homesick or if I ever did, if they felt I needed a trip home, they were very good like that. Um, I would get that trip home and stuff. Um, but I'm sure I'm sure lads would have been back and forth for a while, so it won't be as big of a shock to them. It's just the first eight weeks. Once they get over that, they they'll be fine. Yeah, and I know from knowing you that. When you when you were in the UK, you were quite happy, even though you did miss home at times. Homesickness is an issue for some people, not for other people. How did you find that? Because I, again, I know from from speaking to you over the years that you seemed quite happy there, but you and you were still able to go back, and your mum and your brother and your sister were able to jump on a flight over whenever they really wanted to. But just how did you find that? Because you seem to you seem to have been able to settle quite well. Yeah, um, just having family who can come over, you know, whenever you needed them to, and. I suppose the club were pretty good. If I had a, an international trip, I'd get maybe a couple of days beforehand, a couple of days after. Um, I'd just try to eat as much out as I could. and They were very flexible with me. And to have my mum and my uncle um, and my brother or sister or whoever I needed to come over, they could come over you know, whenever I asked. They had a couple of flights from the club. and um, Even if they had used them up, they did come out come over at their own expense like so it was really good like that I, I, I had no problem and it was really down to the digs lady as well she, it was like having um, your own mum over there um, home away from home I suppose yeah and as well I'm interested in the education side of things and it's a debate that young people have with their parents and their schools and, and their agents you know at the age of 15, 16 all the time is you leave Ireland to go and be a footballer you don't do your leave insert, mm-hmm. but you do certain aspects of education in the UK. Just talk to me a little about that, you know, the education side of things, how that was in your mind, and what young players in England do from an education point of view. Well, I, I was just, once I, I think I left in June, after June or cert, um, so I wasn't really thinking about education, and I was just, I'm sure, no lad does, I'm sure he just thinks about his football, but when you're over there, um, I don't know how other clubs run, run their education, but... With Wolves, we do education full day on a Wednesday and a half day on a Friday. Um, we do physiology, science, uh, sports science, stuff like that. Just stuff related to football and that's a two-year course. Uh, it's a BTEC in sports science. So, and if you if you want to continue that, you can. If if you want to if you want to stop, some lads can. Um, there's also uh, an LFE course, uh, which is an MVQ. So. You, you do that hand in hand with the sports science course, and um, that's how Wolves run. I'm not sure how you know many other clubs run it, but if if you want to, if you finish that up and you want to continue, you, you can. And if you want to do something else, you can explore something else. Of course, the stats for young Irish people who do move to England are not fantastically good. I know everybody has to back themselves to go and make it in inverted commas, and I know you were the same, but. At that period of time, it is a decision that you're making as a young person with your family and stuff, but everyone believes that they can do it. And when you do leave the education, we've seen people who are older than you come home and, and have nothing. Was that in your mind? And, you know, I suppose the fact that you do leave school is to make you even more determined as a footballer to make it as your career because you have left education and the prospect of going to college in a few years might not be as good as it would be if you had a leaving cert. Um, I'm sure, like, every lad who goes over has that even though you don't want it, you have that little thought in the back of your head saying, you know, like, what if, what if it doesn't work out? Um, because, as you said, the percentage is so small, not only for Irish people going to England, but for footballers in general. Um, it's such a small percentage to get that second contract or whatever. Um, but leaving school and and missing out on, on the leaving cert, I suppose, is a, it's a bit of a downer, but you're doing what you love, um, you've got a couple of years, you've got a bit of education over in England. I said if you want to continue on, I'm sure you can. You can do your, your own bits and stuff like that. And if it, if it does happen for a lad, then he, you know, he has to come back and, and do educate. He has to come back and go to college. Uh, I'm sure the club will give him some good recommend, recommendations and stuff like that. And he, after the sports science course, he might continue that over here in the college. Yeah, and I know as well, maturity is an important part of this. And, and, you know, for someone who's your age, you went over as a young person, but you matured very quickly, which definitely helped you as well. Um, Dan, I want to finish finally to speak about Ireland. Um, As I mentioned earlier on, you've played in the international underage teams, under 15, under 16, under 17, under 18, and under 19. Um, I think you were the captain for a couple of those age groups as well, involved in every single squad possible, played in every single game possible, bar one. That's something, as every young lad, you know, has a dream of playing for Ireland. You've done quite a lot. Just speak to us a little bit about that. Yeah, obviously, 
everyone dreams of that, you know, when they when they're playing football, you know, you dream of playing for Ireland and to have done that for so long, you know, I was blessed with that. Um but I had there was a strong bunch there, so there was some, some good lads I played with and um we didn't achieve as much as what we would have liked, you know, the seven innings this year. They got to the second quarter final I think, um in, in the Euros. Um but we, we, we couldn't make it to the finals at any stage and we we'll all be disappointed with that but um as you said, to have played so many games, you know, for myself it was an honour. Um but I missed out on, on one and I was disappointed with that but yeah, the manager felt I suppose it was it was the right decision. So Yeah, and I know we're gonna have a look in a minute at one of the photos of you playing for Ireland. I'm not sure if in the photo you have the captain's armband on or not, but Every kid, including me, grew up and said, I want to play for Ireland. I didn't get to do it because I wasn't very good at football and I want to be a captain for Ireland. Is being the captain of your country, standing there for the national anthem, standing there shaking the other team's captain's hand with the armband and the pennant in your hand as good as we all like to think it is? Brilliant, yeah, it is, definitely. Um, Yeah, we're actually having a look now at you, if you want to look to your left there, Dan. Uh Uh, Playing for Ireland, under 15 that looks like, uh, in the AUL in Dublin. Uh, Captain's Arba, number two with the pendant in your hand. The worst hairstyle I've possibly ever seen. That's a perm. That's a perm that Dan got. Anyway, hairstyle apart, that's the type of photo I'm talking about. Being an Ireland captain at any age group, uh, that's a a very uh, nice thing to look at. And I'm sure, uh, from your point of view, I think you're very, very proud of. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to have done that for a couple of years, I was was honoured at that. Um, you know, going up, shaking the hand, singing the the national anthem. Um, it's what you dream of, isn't it? So to have done that for for quite a while, I was I was really lucky. Yeah, and I know you got to see many different places around the world and different tournaments and different places and playing against you know different countries, different nationalities and stuff as well. How much of a help was that in your development? You're 19 now. 18. 18. You're turning 19 soon. Um, to have played obviously in the UK and here in Ireland, but the international games, different places around the world, different types of opposition as well. For you as a footballer, having played so many international games at the age of 18 is a, a fantastic experience. Mm, um, just even the the plane travel and stuff like that. Some people, some people don't like it and stuff. And to have travel on a plane, I suppose, from such a young age, and it's just second age now. I suppose it's like getting in the car and. Um, having a car journey, I suppose. Um, but I've played against so many great players and been in a lot of different countries. You know, experienced their culture and stuff like that. It's it's been good, especially for someone at uh, such a young age, I suppose. Yes, indeed. Now, Dan McKenna. Very finally, we've spoken a lot about football over the last uh, twenty five minutes or so. What do you do away from football to relax and unwind? It's a very all-encompassing sport, particularly when you're in England. I know one of the pluses of you being back here is that you get to see family and friends and stuff. I know you're a very bad pool player, <laughs> but uh, apart from that, what do you do away from football to let the brain relax? I just, I've got some great friends, um, and I, I just like to surround myself with friends and family, really, be around them as much as I can. and. Um, it, it takes your mind off football, I suppose. If you can make a few memories with them and a couple of experiences, um, then you can take your mind off football and it's not it's not going in your head 24-7. So uh, I like to spend as much time as I can with them. And then just on a, on a last note, you're on loan with Bray at the minute in the League of Ireland. You've got another year in your contract at Wolves, of course, in the Premier League now, so a Premier League club. What's your plan in terms of staying with Bray, going back to the UK and stuff like that, or do you know yet? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back over there on the 30th of June. Uh, I don't know how it's going to... I know the lads over there are back in on the 28th. Um, they're, they're finished now for the summer, so I don't know if I'll get a break or not, but if I do, I'll be thankful for it. If I don't, I'll go straight back in and, and work as hard as I can to get back into the 20th race. Then. Dan McKenna, thanks a million. Cheers, thank you, Jamie. You're on episode 14 of the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's Jamie Moore here. Delighted to be joined by Dan McKenna there. If you missed that, the full podcast interview, you'll find it on offtheball.com right now. In a few minutes' time, we're going to be joined uh, by uh, St. Pat's Dean Clark to talk about uh, their uh, latest win in the league and also our first division focus. We'll chat to the Athlone manager, Terry Butler, and the Finn Harps boss, Ollie Horgan. But for now, I'm joined in studio by uh, Off The Ball's Darren Cleary. Darren, how are you? Jamie Moore, how are you keeping? I'm very good, sir. Yourself? I'm not too bad at all now. Now, St. Pat's, three wins in a row. Unbelievable. The kind of run that the Saints thought they were well capable of going on last season with the quality quality they had in their squad. Unfortunately, it hadn't gelled for them by the end of last year. They're in a bit of a relegation battle, but they have turned things around pretty well so far. Three wins in a row. It's uh, rare and wonderful. And it was something Dean Clark reflected on when he spoke after the game to Off the Balls League of Ireland podcast. Yeah, we're delighted with the win and the performance, I think. Um, I think we were the better team overall. We had much more design to the way we played I think uh, Sligo came and they were quite direct they kind of 
lump the ball forward to the f- uh, two front men where I think we from from start to finish tried to play from the back and got a just rewards. Dean Clark as well getting amongst the goals for the Saints and he was pretty happy to uh, to play a pivotal part in a 2-0 victory. I'm delighted to get another goal tonight um, especially it was an important goal just gets us into the lead and kind of settle us down a bit and I think the first goal tonight was always going to be really important whatever side managed to get it so um, I think that once we did get it it kind of took the pressure off we did I think play some nice football straight after that and then obviously Tommy took it away at the end and um, made it relatively comfortable What's rare is wonderful for the Saints that is three wins in a row and something Clark not taking for granted because he knows it's been a while since they've managed to string back to back results together Funny enough, it was last week when we got two wins in a row. It was the first time the club have done that back to back since twenty sixteen, if I'm if I'm correct. So now we're putting a good bit of form together. Um, obviously it's great to do, especially after the five 0 loss up in the dock. That that's well and truly behind us now, and we've moved on. And we're up to four position now, and things are looking uh, looking a lot more positive. Um, we've been kind of trying to catch up with Rovers and Derry the last couple of, uh, last couple of weeks, and we've managed to do that and now we've put ourselves in a great position come Friday that hopefully we can pick up three points and leave and leapfrog uh, leapfrog Derry Unfortunately for Clark Jamie he couldn't actually walk off the pitch with the rest of his teammates he he picked up a back injury the uh, severity of which he'll tell us about now Yeah I came off with a back problem it's been at me the last couple of weeks and um, I've been trying I've really been struggling getting through games and tonight tonight was no different Uh, I knew going into that I'd have to kind of push through the pain barrier a bit and once I kind of sat down at half time for 15 minutes it kind of became too much for me I went back out and I told the physio and the gaffer that I'll just give it a go and luckily I did because I ended up scoring five minutes into the second half but um, after that my body just kind of <laughs> told me it's time to go and I had to put my hand up to say come off because I could, got to a stage where I could barely walk um, and it's just been from the overload of games really not being able to recover properly and I like to look, I try my best to look after myself and sometimes these things just happen. I just have to take it on the chin and make sure I recover properly and get myself fit again. The Saints have managed to climb up the table and put themselves in a position where if they continue this kind of form, it really looks like they make a push towards Europe. Starting with the next game, how can they do? Can they gather that momentum and keep it going when they face Derry? A side have had a bit of a blip themselves. Yeah, the game against Derry is massive now for us because, for both teams anyway, because you're either going to leapfrog and uh, jump three points ahead of someone else or else be three points behind someone. So we have to go into it with full confidence and know that we played really well up in Derry and we felt like we didn't get the result that our performance deserved. Um, And obviously we've been really good at home this year, so hopefully we bring that into the game and it's a long journey for them down to Dublin. So we want to take all the advantages we can get and go out and hopefully get four in a row. Yes, St. Pat's Dean Clark there after their 2-0 win over Sligo Rovers at Richmond Park on Tuesday evening. The other games, we spoke already to Dan McKenna about that 2-2 draw for Bray against Waterford on Monday. Well, at the Brandy well finish, Derry City won Dundalk 4. A really good result for Dundalk. I thought the game might have been a draw. Uh, Derry took the lead through Darren Cole, but Brian Garton, Robbie Benson, Michael Duffy and Christian Adderjan got the uh, last goal for uh, Dundalk in the 90th minute, Darren, to secure a 4-1 win. Um, of course, there was only a couple of midweek games this week. That puts Dundalk back on top of the table, 37 points from their 17 games. Cork have played a game less or two points behind. I'm comparing this to two top boxers who are just hitting each other blow for blow. It's fascinating. One week Dundalk top, next week Cork top. It keeps flipping. It's fantastic. It really is. It's the rivalry that has endured over the last few years and it's kept fans interesting, even for, for neutrals. The, obviously, the relegation race was fascinating last year, but Cork and Dundalk duking it out and finally seeing Cork get the win, it was something I'm not even sure I thought would happen, even when they had a big lead. After Sean Maguire left, there was a bit of a wobble and we wondered whether or not they would force their way over the line or would they be perennial bridesmaids it was great to see them and it's great to see the fact that this this rivalry has endured the fact that Pat Hooban has come back and he's been a bit of a talisman for Dundalk this year I think he's a top scorer in the league now at 11 goals he's been crucial to their success and I'm have to admit I'm a bit surprised that Cork have been able to keep pace with Dundalk without 
an out and out goal scorer. They haven't had anyone who's grabbed ten goals yet. They've spread them amongst them. Sadly, as we've as we kind of predicted, would be a a pretty key figure for them and Cummins too. Um, I'm really really impressed with them. I'm impressed by how tight it's been and the fact that they have looked like they will push each other right to the wire. It's one of these really fascinating and intriguing title races. It certainly is and uh, this coming weekend as well both teams will be looking for points as well to continue uh, their rise up the table or at least towards the top of the table should I say. Dundalk in Dublin to face Bohemians that game is at uh, Dalyman Park at 7.45. It's Cork against Bray which we mentioned it with Dan McKenna. That game is in Turner's Cross. Cork expecting another sellout crowd. The crowds in there have been absolutely unbelievable. St. Pat's against Derry which Darren mentioned that's a quarter to eight kick off in uh, Richmond Park and in Chicor. Well, Waterford against Limerick. Waterford high flying. Limerick really struggling towards the bottom and that game also taking place on Friday. But one game on Saturday and Port one for Shamrock Rovers it's Sligo Rovers against Shamrock Rovers which is a quarter to eight kickoff in the showgrounds we spoke earlier on to Graham Burke about Shamrock Rovers form Darren and uh, they really need to try and uh, start winning some football matches really one win in eight games isn't good enough but you feel that the results don't really tell the story they're one of these teams where if it wasn't for bad luck they'd really had no luck anything that could go wrong has gone wrong in recent weeks I mean the one win in eight games doesn't tell the story of the fact that that came against Cork the draw the last week as well you felt that they might have been a little bit unfortunate it's not good enough though you can make the excuses all you want and you do have to feel sorry for them because you do get a sense that if their luck turns they'll put a run together and will push for Europe but it's unthinkable that they're so far behind at, at this juncture in the season. I, mean, I think it's 11 points off uh, third spot, the last automatic Euro- Europa League qualification spot. Uh, they were a team that I think their talking got them in trouble last year. Stephen Bradley said that we would be, we should be winning titles, we're in the title race. This year he kind of changed his tune and mentioned that it was a long-term plan and the fact that maybe they wouldn't be challenging for titles. For them to be so far off the pace so soon it's not good enough and while you can say that they have been unlucky in matches and perhaps their luck will turn and they'll climb up the table you've got to wonder how they've managed to find themselves in this position at this point of the season because for me it's precarious they shouldn't be here and it's a point where they should be uncomfortable with their league position and I'm not so sure they are Oh, I think they definitely are. I think they definitely are. Currently sixth in the table, 15 points off the top. And well, they're not making the sounds of a team that are uncomfortable. Like, last year, every time you spoke to Liam Buckley, you got the sense that being in a relegation fight just upset him. It annoyed him. He struggled with it. He was almost a man at his wit's end. It was constantly frustrating for him. When you talk to Rovers, it's not that they have a positivity that's not warranted. They're right to be positive. You don't want them to be doom and gloom or pushing panic buttons. But... You would like better in terms of explanation. I know a lot of Rovers fans who want to know why they are where they are and they don't feel like they're getting that from the, the players or the manager at the moment. OK, interesting comments there about uh, Shamrock Rovers and they will hope to bounce back this weekend. As you mentioned, that's against Sligo in the Sligo showground, 7.45pm this coming Saturday. Rovers do, of course, uh, have a squad that can build points uh, towards uh, that top four again if they start to win some football matches. It's episode 14 of the League of Ireland podcast on Off the Ball. It's Jamie and Darren here. Time for our first division focus now. In a moment, we're going to speak to Ollie Horgan, who is the Finn Harps manager, and Terry Butler, the new manager of Atlone Town until the end of the season. But the results uh, from the weekend, they finished Atlone nil, Drogheda United won uh, that game taking place in Atlone Town Stadium. Chris Lyons got the winner for Drogs in the 50th minute. Uh, people thought, including me, that Atlone might be beaten by more in that game, but they weren't uh, defended quite well by all accounts. Shells nil, Finn Harps nil in the game at Talking Park, which we'll speak to Ollie Horgan in a moment. A massive win for Galway United, who beat top of the table UCD by two goals to nil. Owen McCormack and Ryan Connolly uh, with the goals there for Galway. A big win for Shane Keegan's team. While well, the only other game taking place on Friday was in Wexford. Finch. Wexford nil, Longford two with uh, Jamie Hollywood and either Chris Mulhall or Sam Verdon scoring the second goal. There was a debate among both players as to who actually scored the goal. I think it was Chris. Sam thinks it was Sam. So, yeah, one of them scored the game. Well, Kaya Cove continued their brilliant form. We spoke to Stephen Henderson. Uh, was it last week down or the week before about their problems? They picked up a couple of great wins into the EA Sports Cup semi-finals against Dundalk at home. What a draw for them in that one. They also beat Cabin Teeley 1-0 on Saturday. It was uh, last goal. week, but he is still there, which is encouraging is there, because yeah. at times last week you got the sense that if the promises that were made to him weren't followed through on he would pack up and leave because in fairness he went to bat for his players last week and said that if the club did not treat them the way they deserve to be treated he could not stay in his position his position was not tenable if the promises made to players weren't kept and you can't help I think but admire the fact that he so publicly went and went against the club in the best interest of his players 
Yes, he certainly did as well, and uh, that was a 1-0 win. The goal coming in the second minute, thanks to Keen Leonard. So that was a big win for Cove Ramblers in the league table. We're going to speak in a moment with the fixtures coming weekend. But firstly, uh, we're joined on the podcast by the New at Lone uh, manager. His name is Terry Butler. Terry was the assistant manager with Aaron Callaghan, who, of course, resigned. He was then uh, given a six-month ban from all football activities for breaching some FAI rules. Uh, so I want to ask Terry about the last couple of weeks, a really difficult few weeks for the club. Uh, results in the league, of course, they're uh, currently very bottom of the first division table. Just one point from their 11 matches. And uh, I'm going to ask Terry now just about uh, the previous few weeks, why he took the job and how he plans to help them move up the table. Yeah, well, obviously, Aaron stepped uh, away there um, two weeks ago and he really asked himself and Mitch to stay on and top, hold the fort. So he had one or two meetings with them and um, they left us in place, hopefully, till the end of the season. What attracted you to being the Athlone manager, especially given results this season and, and the way things had been going? Well, look, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a challenge for, for a start and secondly, it's, a, it's an opportunity and totally we brought in a lot, a lot of the, the players ourselves. So, you know, uh, we wanted to work with the players that we had there. So, you know, looking, I'm looking forward to the, the challenge. Uh, probably the main, the main goals is to stop the leaking of the, of the goals. And I think we, we've started, our performance have been good and we just need to turn in the results now. A final question just on at loan overall. And I don't want to go into Aaron, you know, leaving and, and the banner, mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. Just looking at the attendances for the, the last couple of home matches, you played against Galway recently, 291. A lot of those were Galway fans. It's, it's not the longest trip. The previous two home games against Cove, there was 125 there. Against Finn Harps, only 119. Against Cabin Teeley, 117 and so on. Where mm-hmm. is the club at at the moment in terms of just an overall picture because to be getting that many people to the games is not very much money coming in the gate there's obviously been other stuff going on as well but where is the club at the row with the AstroTurf and the funding and all but just overall for you as the manager now where are things at because with the results on the pitch and, and the crowd's quite low it, 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 it doesn't look in, in an overly positive place at the moment well, obviously my priority is, 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 on the, is on the pitch there has been a lot going on behind the scenes which you know, it's probably deflected a small bit from you know the internal workings of the club. But as far as I know, that that's been addressed. And uh, like when I spoke to the chairman, it, it's very positive going forward. What their you know their ambitions is, is for the club, and uh, but that's about it. I don't have a lot more to say on on that end. Jamie, as you know, money in the, the job two weeks, so therefore my total focus, along with Mitch and Kieran and that, is is totally with the with the players. They've, yeah, and I suppose from your point of view, Terry, now as the manager, and this is you know in, rela- in relation to football, like Aaron did say that there was no physio and no warm up gear for one of the games. There was no bus for the away match in Wexford. Are you happy and confident that the club will provide for you and the players what you feel you need? Because if you've got an away game, you do need a bus. If you've got a, a match, you do need a physio, and they are things that the club need to give to you. Yeah, well, look, all, all that situation has been addressed. I'm uh, confident that the assurance I've got and. Um, as I said, we, we had meetings, meetings with him, uh, with John and the lads down there. And uh, yeah, look, we, we, hopefully we'll, we, we'll turn all that around. The insurance has been given to me and physio was there. I think, to, to be fair, on the night regarding the physio, it was a, a genuine mistake. The, 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 the guy got cut out for um, some duty or something like that. So, you know, again, I don't look at the past. I try, I try to look at the, at the, at the present and uh, it's forward for me, not looking, looking backwards. Yeah, because I think from your point of view as the manager, Terry, you want to try and give the players the best you can give because if you are going to climb the table and pick up your first win, etc., you do want things to be right. So then when you are doing the training and the coaching and, and on the match night, everything is there for them that when they go onto the pitch at a quarter day on a Friday, they can perform to their best. Of course, Jamie, like any clubs I have been with, it, all the basic stuff for players is, 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 is there and that's the essentials of, of the game, physio, etc, etc. So, uh, yeah, that, that, as I said, that's all been addressed over the last couple of weeks and I don't have any, I don't have any complaints in, in that regard. At Lone's new manager, Terry Butler, speaking to us here on the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast. We're going to move from Terry to the Finn Harps boss, Ollie Horgan. Finn Harps are now fourth in the league table. They got 21 points from their 11 games. They picked up a couple of really important victories recently. A scoreless draw in Talca Park, uh, of course, uh, on Friday night. But apart from that, uh, they started the season quite poorly, picked up some important wins in recent games. And Ollie knows his team are right back on track for a promotion push. Yeah, well, obviously, yeah, with the fact we picked up a few points. But, you know, we probably ran our look, Jamie, a fair bit in in accumulating, you know, the points that we got in the last couple of games. Um, I, I, I don't know where we're at. I don't know where we are compared to the other teams in the division. It's a serious division, as I said before. And, you know, compared to the last team we're in, it's, it's, um, it's a hell of a lot of, of, of football. Uh, you know, some quality players and, 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 and quality, you know, opposition with teams. All of them we've played, we've struggled. Now, we've picked up a few results along the way, but... 
I, I think you know. I think we need to get better to have any hope of of finishing in the top half. Don't mind finishing in the in 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 the playoff place. Was about that with you? Yeah, you had four wins in a row uh, just before the game at Shells. A 1-0 win over Cabin Teeley, 2-1 against Longford, 2-1 against Strada and 1-0 against Galway. And Ollie, I think that probably shows if you can put a run of three or four or five results together, it really does give you a chance to be near that top four. Yeah, but the, yeah, okay, yeah, but the five games you mentioned, they could have gone the other way. You know, the, the, any of those games, including the Shelburne draw, Shelburne could have won it, Cabin Teeley could have beaten us at the post twice. Longford, we scored in the last minute. I'm not quite sure how, how we managed to win that game because we were excellent. So any of those games could have gone the other way. So, you know, I, I think we need to get better to try and, 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 if you like, repeat those results to have any chance of being up there. But uh, look, at least we've given ourselves a chance at the moment so long as we can stay in contention, to put it that way too. Yeah, and I mentioned the teams who you've beaten recently, particularly Longford, Drogheda and Galway, who you would think will all be in the shake up body come the end of the yeah. season. So the importance of picking up three points against the other teams who are direct competition for promotion is crucial. It is, yeah. But like, if you ask any of those teams, you know, the five teams that you mentioned a while ago, they're probably wondering how we bet them, or indeed, in Shelburne's case, how we got a draw because, you know, we were, we were hanging on and, and maybe... You know, having the rub of the green, especially in the last couple of minutes against Anford and Galway, because you know, <laughs> we, we we probably were outplayed for for a lot of the a lot of the game in both of those two games that I just mentioned. So you know, we need to get better, uh, as I said, to try and stay with the teams you've mentioned, and uh, you know that'll that'll take that'll take time. I feel, Jamie, you know. Yeah, I think Ollie, one of those teams are Cove and we spoke yep. to Stephen Henderson last week all about him resigning and coming back and his players have reacted really well. They're into the EA Sports Cup semi-finals. They're now, of, of course, uh, having picked up a win at the weekend as well, uh, looking to, to try and climb the table. What's your thoughts on uh, facing them on uh, Friday night? Uh, that would be huge difficulty for us. You know, hopefully it can be huge difficulty for them as well, to put it that way to you. But this will be very, very tight if we play. Uh, we 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 were very lucky to get away with three points down in Coleman's Park way back at the start of the season. They had the better chances at nil all, and we we managed to get one probably against the run of play that that, that squeezed us home. But they're going well. Like they bet Langford two nothing in the A Sports Cup, and the previous week Langford had wiped us off the park as regards you know football and possession wise. While we did get get out of there with a result you know it just showed where Cove are at and where they've like I mean to be fair Cove finished third two years ago second last year so they they rise up there and will be rise up there when, when the end of the season comes Interesting stuff as always from Ollie Horgan and Darren I love Ollie Horgan asking there at the end Ollie Horgan is at every single League of Ireland match ever so if his team are playing on a Friday in Donegal and Cove are playing on a Saturday in Cove it's likely he'll be there or he'll be in Longford on a Saturday he goes to so many matches he's a full time teacher he goes to so many matches, um, and it's something that's very common, particularly in the League of Ireland. Like last night, the Pats game, there were so many League of Ireland managers there, first division as well, particularly on a Saturday. I went to see Longford a few weeks ago, playing, I think, against UCD, and there were six of the other eight League of Ireland managers at the match, which shows the dedication. They've got kids, they've got yeah, wives. Yeah, their wives love it, and their full-time they, they were employment there. love it. Yeah. Yeah, um, Ollie Horgan, I wonder who has the better attendance record, Ollie or Tom? Because they are both seem to be mainstays in the League of Ireland grounds. Tom was in Richmond last night. This, of course, is a very famous League of Ireland fan whose name is Tom. And uh, Tom was speaking to a few of the journalists at the press box at halftime. It was Pats against Sligo. It was nil all. I thought it was actually quite a decent game. But uh, Tom said that it was the worst, the two worst le- uh, teams in the League of Ireland. He wasn't too impressed with Pats or Sligo. But uh, Pats won 2 nil. I think you yeah, should sit up and listen if Tom says that because he's a man who's in an awful lot of League of Ireland football. He certainly is indeed. Speaking of an awful lot of League of Ireland football, a busy weekend in the First Division again this coming weekend. Uh, the fixtures, Drogheda against Wexford, which is a 7.45 kickoff uh, up there in United Park on Friday. It's UCD against Athlone in the UCD Bowl. Finn Harps against Cove. We spoke about long trips. What a long trip for Cove going to Finn Harps. And of course, the First Division clubs there don't necessarily have the budget to go overnight or whatever. So a long trip to get to, of course, Harps. And then to get home. And if some of them have kids to get up on the Saturday morning or go to work, it's a long, long trip in the first division. Uh, well, Saturday... It's a long trip in either division. I remember we had Ian yeah. Morris on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And bowls obviously are, are, are part-time in nature, but full-time in the way they operate. But they're guys that can't afford to be dedicated to football full-time. They're travelling up in the middle of the night. They get home at 2 or 3 in the morning and some of them are up at five and six for work the next morning. It's not just the uh, the first division that has these unenviable trips. It's not great. And I think we've kind of moaned about it a few times on the podcast, the fixture list and teams playing Friday, Monday, Friday, Monday. Correct. It's very, very difficult. 
especially on stretch budgets. I know we don't see it in the first division, but for Premier Division clubs, it's uh, it's almost unworkable for a lot of those players. Yeah, the other two games in the first division on Saturday, it's Longford against Shells at half past seven, a game I'll be at, and Cabin Tealy against uh, Galway. That game is on Sunday in Stradbrook at three o'clock. Not sure of the reason for that. Hopefully the Cabin Tealy generator has been fixed or that Eddie Gormley has happened to find oh, an electrician man. maybe to fix them. But anyway, that game, Cabin Tealy against Galway, is at three o'clock on Sunday. That is the end of our first vision wrap. Now we've got a couple minutes left, Aaron. We wanted to just bring you something that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, um, which was the behaviour of fans, adult fans in the League of Ireland stadiums. We spoke last week about Limerick and about some fans in Limerick getting themselves in trouble. The club saying they don't want them because of the abuse they were given to the players. Uh, spoke privately to a Limerick player who was saying that he feels that it does impact on young people and parents bringing their children to the games. We put that interview, or my comment certainly, on the Off The Ball Facebook page uh, last week and got some interesting comments uh, supporting what I said and also supporting what you said, that you felt that you know, it shouldn't have an impact on uh, bringing kids to games and that I should basically shut up and bring kids to games. If you had any kids, you could bring the game. I wouldn't suggest I have you cousins getting or, 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 kids yeah, and bringing yes. them to the game. No, I'm I have sure little cousins or, or whatever, but yeah. Yeah, no, you made the point and I think... I certainly didn't feel it was an issue because I've, I've noticed the language and I've noticed the way fans act and I kind of accepted that this is just the way some fans act at football matches. Some will go and eat their chips and enjoy the match without saying a word to anyone. Others will go and be with their big social circle and some will go and they'll want to shout at the ref for 90 minutes. I, I get your point. I understand it. I was surprised by a lot of people agreeing with you and just to bring you through some of the comments, um, there were literally hundreds. Um, we basically asked, you asked, is the behaviour of some football fans discouraging parents from being, bringing kids to matches? Bernard said, completely agree with Jamie, even away from the ultras, what the referee officials are called at matches by people with kids can be unbelievable. Uh, totally agree. Fans seem to think that they can do what they want to officials. Then there was someone who called you a Helen Lovejoy C-U-N-T. Lovely. Um, Thank you. And said, if you don't like the language, you can F off and uh, support rugby. And then he called you a minnow. His name was Jamie as well. He was well, on Twitter. I would like to confirm I'm not a minnow and I am entitled, totally entitled to my opinion. Someone called you snowflake language. as well. That's fine. They can call me what they want. But I Helen fully Lovejoy, believe in my you, comments. Do you get the reference there? No, I don't. But uh, if Lovejoy I could get a job on soccer AM, I'd be happy enough. No, that's not Helen Lovejoy. You're thinking of a different Helen. Oh, that's Helen Chamberlain. Who's <laughs> Helen Lovejoy? Is she in a soap or something? Helen Lovejoy was in The Simpsons. Helen Lovejoy. Oh, was she Ned Flanders wife? Yes. Yes. No, okay. she was the Reverend's wife. Okay. She said, won't somebody please think of the children? Think of the children. I, I agree. Think of the children. But that's why he's calling you a Helen Lovejoy C U N T. Anyway, if people would like to uh, read that uh, article, it's on the Off the Ball Facebook page and Off the Ball. And we'd love to, like to hear comment. From, you still could. We'd love to hear from players because this is something that players would like to get involved with, particularly with the Limerick instance highlighting it and comments made about player sisters and chants and stuff that are just really just mean spirited. So if you're a player and you've noticed this and you feel it affects you, please do get involved with the debate. It's ongoing. We'd love to hear as many opinions as we can on it. I'm at Radio Cleary on Twitter and you're at Jamie Moore Sport. That's it as well. You'll find us well on Twitter at Off The Ball where you'll find the full podcast, the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast episode 14. That just about wraps us up. We need to thank Graham Burke who we sat down with during the week, Daniel McKenna who joined us in the studio as well as Dean Clark from St. Pat's, the Atlanta manager Terry Butler and the Finhouse manager Ollie Horgan. That full podcast, as I mentioned, is on offtheball.com. You'll also be able to watch it on on our YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever else you happen to find your podcast. Darren, thanks a million. Thank you, Jamie. We're back on offtheball.com next Wednesday. Thanks to uh, Rafti Allo for uh, making the magic happen behind the scenes as well, producer. And we'll speak to you next Wednesday, folks. See you. Bye-bye.